Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. This is Elizabeth Townsend Gard, your host, and I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School and a faculty fellow at the A.B. Friedman School of Business at Tulane. And I just want a quilt. So today we have Professor Roberta Qual. Bobby Qual joins us. She is the Raymond Nero Professor of Intellectual Property Law and the founding director for the Center for Intellectual Property Law and Information Technology at DePaul uh, College of Law. She is also the leading expert on right of attribution, moral rights. So we're going to talk about what is more, what are moral rights. And finally, she is the author of the book called The Soul of Creativity, put out by Stanford University Press in 2010. Um, and she, uh, this book is great. If this is some, if you like what she's talking about, this is the book for you. Oh, um, my name is Roberta Rosenthal Qual, and I'm calling from Chicago. Awesome. And um, do you have any memory of someone sewing or quilting in your life? Like your a first memory of something of anyone sewing, sewing? or quilting? <laughs> right. All right, so here, dirty, deep, dark, dirty secret. So I actually, um, you know, like most law professors, was a straight-A student when I was a young young girl, except for one class. The one class that I nearly failed, <laughs> literally nearly failed, was home economics, which wow. was a class that people took, um, you know, back in that day. Um, my mother, who is also not particularly gifted in the sewing department, had to actually sew the dress for me, and it got a C. But, um, so, but having said that, my grandpa, my mom's dad, was a fashion designer. Really? And uh, yeah, but then he got sick and had to like go into a dry, the dry cleaning business. So he really didn't get to, he didn't ever make a living on that, but that was his plan. And his other daughter, my mom's sister was actually very talented uh, sewing wise. And actually in my office where I'm sitting right now, I have a painting. It's a, it's a needlepoint um, picture uh-huh. that my aunt did. Oh, it's not exactly nice. quilting, but it's, yeah. you know, it's in the crafts. same ring. Right. So I have sort of some talent in my greater family, but it's of absolutely no visibility in my line or my lineage. I have three daughters, as yeah, you know. And, your, and your three kids don't, they don't no. sew or anything. That's None of them do any of that. Right. Right. Very so yeah. So that's kind of where we are with that. Awesome. <laughs> um, okay. So what I wanted to talk to you about. So tell me a little bit about what are moral rights? How do we understand what a moral right is? Because we hear this bandied about but let's start from the beginning. And you are like the expert in the world on this stuff. So, <laughs> Well, I don't know about that, but I've certainly done a lot of writing about moral rights. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, that I guess that qualifies me as having some knowledge in that. So moral rights, which are protected um, by the vast majority of countries, including developing countries, um, except they are not well protected in the United States, and we can get into that. But moral rights are um, are are a segment of copyrights. They're usually protected as part of the copyright statutes in any given jurisdiction in any, in any given country. But instead of protecting the economic rights that copyright law protects, meaning um, the right to reproduce, the right to distribute, the right to display, the right to make a derivative work, et cetera, Moral rights protect the personal interests of authors, in especially uh, the right to attribution, right. which can also include the right to be anonymous or to write under a pseudonym or create under a pseudonym, as well as the right to maintain what I call the message and meaning of one's work, which is known uh, legally as the right of integrity. Right. So again, moral rights are, are the type they are they are designed to protect the personal interests that creators have in their works as opposed to the economic interests. All right, so let's take one by one and then let's explain. Let's figure out why why you said not in the u s because I think what's interesting is that I think these right of attribution is something that people care most about of anything that I keep seeing in this study is the right to be named and to be part of sort of they, you know, that's super important to people. So let's start with right of attribution. What is right of attribution? 
Right. And, you know, it's, it is, it is funny that you say that, you know, I, when you say Elizabeth, I, you know, people care most about the right of attribution. I know you, you'll be able to relate to what I'm going to say in a moment. Right. So you and I both, you know, work a lot with law professors and, and deal with law professors a lot. And, and as you know, in the legal Academy, um, you know, people are basically grouped along the lines of their high protectionist, meaning they care a lot about maintaining um, high copyright protection. That's right. not most academics. Right. Most academics are low protection because they really are, you know, very much moved by the ideas of, you know, a more democratic discourse and, and freedom of expression. Not that I'm being critical at all of that, but when it comes to copyrights that they do not like or favor or endorse strong copyright protection. When it comes to moral rights, they're kind of agnostic, right. you know, so they sort of, you know, see the point of it, but, 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 you know, they're, 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 they, they still question it, except when it comes to attribution for their work. <laughs> Right. That's right. And then we get That's a totally right. different uh, right. discussion going, right? So yeah. I agree with you. I think I think people do care a lot about that. And I think that attribution interests sort of are more acceptable, right? They're more politically correct, if you want to put it in those terms. I think integrity interests people have trouble with because they see it potentially um, damaging the uh, freedom of expression. People should be able to use right. other people's works. So and give us an example. So right of attribution is the right to be named or... In some jurisdictions, the right not to be named, to stay anonymous. The, right. Correct. Um, Correct. Right, of, right of integrity is a funny one. Tell us a little bit about what that means, right of integrity. So the right of integrity means, that, as I said before, I define it in terms of the right to have the meaning and the message of your work um, preserved. So what is the meaning of the work? I look at the meaning of the work, um, and, and perhaps your audience can relate to this, as what is the personal meaning that someone sees in the work, what the author personally sees as the personal expression and the meaning of that work. Right. Um, I see the message as the message that the author wants to basically uh, give to the world at large, more external, okay? Yeah. But either way, okay, either way, um, the author has a right to have that, preserved so that people don't modify the work without the author's permission. And if they do modify the work, it's very clear that this is a modification and that this wasn't the original work. Another issue that's very problematic, especially in the U.S., where what I'm about to discuss has no protection, even under the law that protects moral rights in a very skinny way, cabined way, is the right to um, not have your work presented in an, uh, in an objectionable context. So in other words, where your work is presented in a way that you would not have uh, endorsed it. And so one of the best examples that, that I often talk about is the movie, The Devil's Advocate. Um, it goes back some years, but the, the, um, the, the, the problem in that movie uh, surrounded the last scene where there was a sculpture that came alive and the figures of the sculpture groped one another as Al Pacino, who was the star of the movie, uh, the devil who came to earth uh, in the guise of a corporate lawyer, of course. And what he was doing in that scene was encouraging his two kids to engage in incest. Meanwhile, the backdrop was the sculpture where these figures came alive and they grope each other erotically. Well, that sculpture was a near exact reproduction of the sculpture Ex Nihilo, created by Frederick Hart. And so he was appalled that a work that he created for 13 years, during which time he converted to the Roman Catholic faith, uh, actually was used as the backdrop for a scene in incest. Um, and um, again, you know, there have been many examples actually of this in litigation over the course of time. Um, and to be honest with you, um, the, the, there's really no remedy. It's not protected by law. Um, here in the States, and and there's nothing that you can do if somebody else owns the copyright to the work, so. Right, so, um, okay, so why doesn't the United States have these protections? So I think it's largely political. Um, you know, for years, I, I would say early on, uh, by early on, I mean, you know, in the, in the 18, 19, early 1900s, you know, we are a capitalistic um, society. And we don't revere and value art in the way that some of our, particularly our civil law um, countries do. And so I think we don't have that history. Um, our, the policies that have shaped the United States have been a much different type of policy discussion when it comes to copyright. And, and economics has really always been the preeminent right that has been uh, protected in the U.S. When moral rights 
did come on the radar screen were a couple years was a couple years after we joined the Berne Convention. We joined in eighty eight, and the United States enacted the Visual Artist Rights Act, which, as I mentioned, performs a very limited cabin type of moral rights protection for right. um, only only visual artists and only certain types of visual artists. Right. So take us through that. Let's um, why first why so limited. And sort of, how do we, I'm going to try to get it up on my screen now. Sure. Uh, well, we can talk about why so, so Vera, the language of Vera uh, provides protection only to paintings, drawings, prints, and sculptures. So in order to, uh, and photogra- and photographs, I will say as well, but only those taken for exhibition purposes only. And there's been litigation that if the photograph wasn't taken for an exhibition purpose, it doesn't get covered. So, so it's a very narrow framework. And how do they define, do we know how they define painting? Is painting have to be with, like, paint? Uh, well, it, it also covers prints, but but yeah. that would be a sort of a derivative, I would imagine. Right, that. right. So, um, I which think... Is a, which is a smaller definition, just so people recognize. So, copyright protects pictorial, graphic, and visual sculptural. arts. Sculptural. And sculptural arts, work. right. Yeah. Uh, so, it's broader than... so. It's broader than Vara. Vara is much no. more near, right? right? Well, copyright law, that... well, no, copyright law protects any type of work of authors. Right. But as in, right. in so, that category, like is the category of pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works larger under the general copyright law than it is under Vara? Um, or is it the same? I would say pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works are probably subsumed under paintings, drawings, prints, and sculptures, Right. So, I mean, a graphic, you know, could be, a print could be, it doesn't say what the print has to consist of, right? Nor what the painting has to consist of, right? Got it. Okay. So I think it's probably, you know, so probably one of the most um, on point cases here is the case involving the um, landscape art. Yeah. um, Involving the, this was in Chicago, actually it was a Seventh Circuit case and it involved um, uh, the landscaped art. It was, it was the size of a football field and um, the artist, and what happened was the city of Chicago kind of came along and chopped it in half and, 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 you know, changed it. And the artist Chapman Kelly was, you know, really um, concerned and upset about what right. had happened. Right. So I remember, um, I remember actually sitting in my office um, one day, this was years ago, and one of our most prominent um, art lawyers uh, here in the city, actually in the country, Scott Hodes, called me and he said, what do you think? Do you think the, this football field of landscape art, right. you know, would come under Vera? And and I, I actually said, no way, because Vera is very limited and it doesn't really qualify as a sculpture right. um, or a painting or a drawing. And so, um, but somebody took the case. Um, I don't think it was Scott, but I don't don't think Scott took it, but but somebody took the case and represented Chapman Kelly. And it had a very torturous history in both the federal, the district court and the, um, and the seventh circuit. Bottom line was he didn't get relief. Um, It it was sort of a, I think the seventh circuit might've left open the possibility that Vera would cover it, but they 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 rejected the claim as i recall because it wasn't uh human totally human because it's landscape art and so right. the, the, the garden looks the way it does because of nature and right. I, I don't think i would agree with that i, yeah. I personally i think if, if you're going to consider it landscape art you're going to consider it under vera and, and i wouldn't i, I think I, I remember that case because i remember teaching it um that they didn't even say it was copyrightable. I mean, they they went so far as to not even give it copyright protection, much less va- that Vera, was the lower. Right? Yes, that was that's the lower right. Court, right. Because they said it wasn't human, so right. it has to be right. Has to be Had created to be human. By, right, right, right. And I don't agree with that because yeah. I think I, I've I've always I, my position is that that the Chapman Kelly basically you know created the patterns, planted the seeds, and he mixed his his work you know in and just because it's sort of like you know copyright protects if you've got a painter you know that 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 quote in one of the famous supreme older supreme court cases if you've got the painter who there's a clap of thunder and the paintbrush moves and he has something that's not intended it still can be considered it can be embraced by the painter right, and right. Her, her work yeah. i would say the same thing if yeah. you've got nature and thunderstorms and you know whatever kind whatever of it is right yeah so you're still, i don't you're still the actor behind it and yes. the author behind it, so therefore, okay. So visual art. So I've got up the definition, and it's interesting that the definition is a negative. So a work of visual art does not include 
Okay, yeah. Any poster, map, globe, chart, technical drawing, diagram, model, applied art, motion picture, or other audiovisual work, book, magazine, newspaper, periodical, database, electronic information service, electronic publication, or similar publication, or merchandising item or advertising, promotional descriptive covering or packaging material or container. So I think that's super interesting. Oh, there's any, or any portion not subject to copyright protection under this title, which is the Chapman Kelly one too, right? Mm-hmm, exactly. Okay. So getting back to crafts and art, we don't fit under any of those knots, right? It's We're not posters. We're not maps. We're not globes. Right. So does that mean that quilts are could be covered by Vara as paintings? I, mean, I, I think you could. You know, it's interesting because Vara also says what it, um, you know, what it does cover, right? Yes, there's right. A, say there's a, a, um, a, a provision of Vara that, um, you know, actually talks about um, paintings, sculptures, uh, photographs, but only for exhibition purposes right. only. Right. Um, I don't know if you can pull that one yeah, up. Yeah, I'm well, looking for this. Okay. 106. Maybe when 106 I have 106A right. up, let's see what writes. Uh, let's see. Right. Scope. And I'm looking. Yeah, I'm looking as well. I can see all the things it does. Duration. Transfer and waiver. I don't see the definitions. Are the definitions in 101? Or are they in 106A? They could be in 101. I thought they were. They might be in 101. Okay, let me take a look. Um, oh, you think it's in not under? Oh, okay, hold on. I'm looking as well. This and I'm very exciting. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, meant, um, I, I do this I, a lot. We, we do a lot of looking up because, like, that's just the world we live in. Okay. Yes, exactly. So for the people who are listening, we're at 17 USC um, and 101, of that's where the Copyright Act lives. 101 is the definitions and 106A is where moral rights lives. So we're looking at what we're trying to do is see where quilts and crafts fit. I would say... Here is it. It's being elusive. It's the elusive definition. It oh. is. El- oh, think- here it is. It's above it. So a work, okay. a work of visual art is a painting, drawing, print, or sculpture existing in a single copy, in a limited edition of 200 copies, or fewer that are signed and consecutively numbered by the author, or in the case of a sculpture, in multiple cast, carved, or fabricated sculptures of 200 or fewer that are consecutively numbered by the author and bear the signature or identifying mark of the author. That's the first one. Or, this is your second one, a still photographic image produced for an exhibition purposes only, meaning not for just clicking, like, you know, the, the kid... Uh, existing in a single copy that is signed by the author or in a limited edition, 200 copies or fewer that are signed and consecutively numbered by the author. Okay, so I think, what do you think? So here's what a quilt is. Let me tell you what the definition of a quilt is. A quilt is a unique object that is usually made, the kinds of quilts that are exhibited at uh, quilt shows. Um, They go for a lot of money. Um, they usually have one copy, a single copy. I mean, there's patterns and other stuff, but the kind of sure. ones that we're really interested in, um, they can come in any form. So it's a piece of fabric, something in the middle, batting usually, and then another piece of fabric. It can be um, a photograph. It can be whole cloth. It can be pieced. It can be appliqued. It is expression. It's artistic expression. Um, there are protest quilts. There are all kinds of things that are um, – it is artistic um, in many ways. And they do get exhibited in museums. Um, and they are a legitimate form of art at this point. Like they weren't before like, you know, a certain period of time people saw them as bed coverings. I don't think that – they can be useful articles, but I think it's aesthetically separable – the making it a blanket versus yeah. the uh, art part. So that's that would be my definition of a quilt is that it's the aesthetic sep- the aesthetic elements of the quilt, not the comfort of the quilt that we're looking at for Vara. Correct, correct. And I and I think that your definition, which comports with what I would have thought uh, yeah. when I think of a quilt, being just yeah. a lay person in this regard uh, yeah. in the world of quilting, you know, I I think that that would be. Um, 
that would sort of, I think, be a test case yeah. for Vera in the way that the uh, landscape art was right. a test case. Because I think it's very similar. It, it's not the same, obviously, but I think a lot of the elements that make landscape art somewhat questionable. I mean, I guess the it, it would landscape art is probably more closer to a sculpture. Quilting, uh, I'd say it's in between maybe a painting and a sculpture. I don't and know. Maybe it's, drawing. It just depends. I mean, drawing, yeah. the top part yeah. is definitely drawing. You're just using fa- you're you're using um, thread to draw, yeah, and then these, exactly. And the painting is, you know, you're putting layers of different fabric together. Um, yeah, it could be a sculpture. I, I don't know. I think it depends on what the quilt is. I mean, these quilts can get really um, amazing uh, and, uh, and and very and varied in many ways. So, I mean, I think you're right. I don't think it's like I think you have to sort of figure out how to how does the, how would the court define a quilt, and then if it, they defined it under painting, drawing, print, or sculpture, it would qualify. Exactly, and you know, one of the problems is that that Vera um, has had a tendency. You know, you asked why. It was so narrow, and we never really talked about that in terms yeah. of what happened with the statute. And the statute was basically when it was enacted. Um, this is 1990. It was sort of appended to a bill called the Federal Judgeships Bill, um, and there were certain. And Vera had been blocked in the Senate by certain Republican senators. So when it got appended to the Federal Judgeships Bill, which the Republican senators wanted, that it, it got passed. So it was one of these like sort of add-ons to another bill that. Um, was really wanted by the senators that had been blocking Vera, so so that was political. But as a result, there was very little, very, very little um, uh, well-thought-out discussion. I remember being asked to give some written testimony, and I did. Um, My testimony was about the, the, the takings issue, the retroactive application of it. But there was very little well thought out discussion. And if you look at other parts of Vera, it's a very problematic statute. Yeah. Elizabeth, the duration is problematic. Yeah. Um, the, the, the subject matter is problematic. The waiver provision from one joint author to another is, you know, one joint author can waive the Vera rights of another joint author. It's all problematic. So I don't know. I, you may know this. I'm sure you do. But last year, the Copyright Office did a study of Vera. And, yeah. and I remember seeing the comments like, oh, they're finally going to look at Vera. You know, it's been 10 <laughs> years. I was all the creativity. They're finally looking at it. Right. So I submitted a lot of commentary on it. And when all was said and done, you know, they, they made minor recommendations. Like, you know, okay, yes, we should make the duration provision not bifurcated but consistent not dependent on when the work was created and you know the joint with the waiver provision for joint authors that's They're terrible just cleaning it up they were just cleaning like doing up, little like cleaning very up. light like dusting like dusting. very light dusting with a feather duster yeah. that's a good yeah but really nothing serious um and so that was to me you know disappointing and the reason they didn't do anything more was this you know notion that our patchwork protections work well I would beg to differ on that. And I think quilting represents, again, I'm not aware of a case on quilting yeah, uh, under I Vera. I haven't seen it either. Yeah, and you you would certainly be on top of that with the podcast. But it does seem to me that when you have the right sort of set of circumstances, when you have somebody who g- gives the quilt to someone, let's say, yeah. a quilt with a very special meaning and message, and they give the quilt to someone, as you know, the quilter still has the copyright. Right. They don't assign the copyright when they give the quilt itself away. And if that quilt were displayed, let's say, in a context that mm-hmm. the original creator didn't approve of or if it was modified in some way and still attributed to the original that would be your test case yes I personally think quilting should be covered um I personally think Vera should cover a lot of things that it doesn't cover like like literature like writing like music yeah None of that's covered. None of it's covered. Just artwork. But the problem is, the problem is that the courts know that Vera was narrowly drafted. And they also know, and this has been in some of the moral rights cases, like what Congress wants to draft more broadly, they know how to do it. They drafted very narrowly. (coughs) All right. So let's say, let's just pretend that quilts are covered. Let's let's get past that. The big pretend, yes. Okay. We can totally pretend. I believe they are covered because I think they are artwork and I think they do they are just another form of painting, drawing or sculpture depending on depending on the type of quilt. Not all quilts would cover, you know, there's commercial quilts and there's, you know, I don't know, we're not going to worry about that. We're talking about art okay. quilts that are being exhibited in shows and museums and galleries. Okay. Okay. So what do you get? So okay, I got I'm like I, we qualify. What happened like what do we get if we qualify for Vera? 
Well, you get, for example, if your quilt is considered of recognized stature, and by the way, that report I was just talking about, one of the things that they did suggest is that the, the definition of recognized stature, which has always been very heavily dependent on academic input and what the experts think, should now be a little bit more broad. Okay, so let's pause there. So yeah. Vera only covers things of recognized stature? For destruction, that's for what I was destruction. about to say. Right, right. The, the destruction. That, those the are the to... um, the uh, the uh, street art cases, right? That's got yes. that's pushed it in really. So you would get ways. the right to prevent destruction right. if your work is or damages if it was destroyed. If your work is of recognized stature, you get the right of positive attribution. All right. So and if somebody else's name is is put on your quilt, you get the right to, of course, you know, object to that. So you have attribution rights. You have integrity rights when the modification is intentional. Yeah. Right. And prejudicial to the creator's honor or reputation. It's got to be president prejudicial. So again, right. the standard is should be what does this do? What does it do to the personal so interest? Of- we saw this great um, in Atlanta, this great exhibit where someone had taken an old quilt, not not probably under Vera, but and had dyed it black. Mm, and it was good. so shocking that it but you could take somebody whose work is like really well known by it. And yes. then dye it black um, yes. and hang it. Um, yes. That would be not only you yeah. kind of created derivative work, and but you've also Vera would sort of kick in and Vera say, would co- if if right. quilts were covered, Vera would would cover that. Yes, right. because you're modif- you're doing an intentional modification. That's right, you and it may horrify the owner. Right. Yes, like the, the um, author. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes, exactly. Um, okay, so you get right of attribution, and uh, you prevent your name from stuff you did not create so that's interesting right to prevent the use of his or her name of which you do not create so you can't well that covers non-authors actually that that right covers people who aren't even authors right yeah like if somebody uses your name let's say elizabeth on something that you you know never uh, never right. created right yeah you know you would have that right i mean yeah. that that's actually one right of error that goes to people other than other than creators. people got it right exactly. and then the right to use distortion mutilation so that's the right of integrity and then the the sort of destruction, as long as you have a national, is it, what kind of a substantial? A work of recognized stature. Work of recognized stature, which is right. so interesting. And there's been a recent case that has adopted a more flexible definition of recognized stature. Interesting. And then, um, and the last, and the last right is sort of a combined attribution, like when there's uh, an integrity violation uh, with attribution, you get, you know, together, you, you get the get right to both. Them. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then there's a whole bunch of exceptions. Like it can't be a work for hire. Yes. What else can it like, right? Uh, Subject to fair passage use. of time. So if it like fades, that that's not a violation of. That's not an intentional. Right. Right. Um, intentional. Yeah. So you've got a bunch of limitations. And then tell me a little bit about the duration part of it. So the duration is problematic. So the duration basically currently, the the current duration under Vera is that if the work is created um, after the enactment of the Visual Artist Rights Act, after 1990, copyright law lasts for the life of the author. (laughs) Right. Right. But if it was created before Vera Uh and the right and the work has not been transferred, Okay, in other words, if the, the title has never been transferred to anyone else. The copyright else, so title. The object the, itself couldn't be transferred, but the copyright right. still is with the author. Right. Then you get copyright protection for the for which is life plus seventy. So that's crazy. So why why did they so copy so for those listening, currently copyright law is life of the author plus seventy years. And so for new things, nineteen ninety and later, it's only for the life of the author. But crazy. for old things, it's life plus seventy. Correct. And nobody has, yeah. And nobody has any, um, nobody has any, again, that, that was one of the things that, that I talked about, you know, years ago as being ridiculous. Um, and nobody has any, um, I mean, nobody has any explanation for that. Like why, you know, nobody knows why it did that. Remember I told you the history of the statute was very frenetic. Right. Right. Yeah. And not considered and not well yeah. thought out. All right. So so interesting. So let's say, um, okay, so let's let's take a scenario. So I am a super famous quilter, let's pretend. Okay. And um, I exhibit my work. Oh, there's been these ex- uh, and then somebody does post posts online or claims it as their own or leaves my name off. Okay. Well, how does Vera help in any of these situations in terms of like you have to actually 
go to court? Like, this is a lot. I mean, how effective is Vera in protecting artists from these two issues of right of attribution and integrity? Well, like anything else, I mean, in order to enforce your rights, you have to go to court, right? So, I mean, a lot of artists don't know about Vera. I mean, that's why this is a good you know, podcast to do because a lot of, you know, and there's been, and there's been um survey, there's been surveys of that, that establish that many artists are completely ignorant about Vera and the fact that also, you know, Vera, you know, they just, they just don't know. So, I mean, you'd have to go to court. You'd have to protect. Do you, you have, have to, to have your work registered to have Vera, like for copyright infringement and going to court, you have to have your work registered with the copyright office. Does Vera I imagine, does Vera require registration as well? You know, I don't know that you actually have to. It comes under the copyright law, right? I think you have copyright protection automatically. So I think if you want to file a lawsuit, you you need to to register. But you have the protection. Right. But to enforce it, you have to have had a register. Now with Fourth Estate, you have to have a registered work. I mean, you have to have a registration certificate. I right. would imagine that that's true with Vera because there's I don't see any kind of exemption sure. for it. No, I think that's absolutely correct. Interesting. Absolutely. Do you right. think that if the small claims court goes through ever, which people say it's not, but it's up again, like we see, we keep seeing the revive pre seventy two sound recordings went through finally. So I'm I'm like more like they're, are they going to slip in small claims when people aren't looking um, the way they did with pre seventy two sound recording um, protection? Do you think if there is a small claims court that Vera will become more robust if maybe maybe you know more access greater yeah. access right possibly right. cheaper to but again get. they have to know though they have to know they have to know they have this right so I mean, how, how successful do you think Vera has been like as artists like if you're like most of them don't know you have to have register your work you have to sue it has to be a big thing happening like you put your images on I mean your your work is on a building that's going to be torn down I mean it has to be something huge for it really to trigger, is that right? I, I think that's right. I mean, I think as a practical matter, most artists don't even know about her era. You know, I, I meet artists all the time. Like just um, perfect example, Elizabeth. I, and again, this isn't quilting, yeah. but just the other day um, I had a meeting with a painter um, because my my new book and her showing, her recent showing sort of have a similar theme. So I went to her home, which is very close by to my home. And she, um, and she said to me something like, oh, you know, I tried reading my last book, The Myth of the Cultural Jew. Uh-huh. She said, I tried reading that book. She said, it was very academic. I couldn't get through it. I said, the book you really need to read is The Soul of Creativity. And I said to her, do you know about moral rights? No clue. She's been training for 30 years. She had no clue what moral rights were. So why did you call your book The Soul of Creativity? I've always wanted to ask you, like, like I love that title. Tell me, tell us, and that's the book. So if you want to learn more, so those listening, if you want to learn more about moral rights, this is this is the book to read. Um, we'll put a link up so that you can um, get to it on um, Amazon. But tell me more about why and what drew you to this subject because you spent a lot of your time looking at moral rights. I'm curious how that happened. Right. Well, how did I, you know, my look, my very first um published article as an academic was on moral rights. Um, this was back in Vandermill, you know, uh, where I talked about uh, copyright and moral rights as being cousins, I believe. Yeah. Um, and I just, I don't know, I, you know, it's interesting because I'm not an artistic person visually. I mean, I don't right. do art. I write, as you know, but I don't do art. Right. But I've always been very drawn to the law. And I think it's because having had a long time to really contemplate my attraction to this area, I think it does relate to the spiritual sense of creativity because yeah, I'm a very spiritual too. person, as you know. Yeah, and I yeah. think that's the piece of it that always has fascinated me, um, like the, that, that what moves an artist to create. Yeah. So the book, The Soul of Creativity, um, I actually, I mean, it was in some ways it was, you know, I had by the time this book was put, look, I started teaching in 83. I wrote about moral rights. The Vanderbilt piece was 1985. So Soul of Creativity is published 2010. So I've been writing for a long time about it. But what the Soul of Creativity really tries to do that's different is look to the motivations for human creativity. And that got me back to um, creativity theory as as the artists are describing it and the philosophers, as well as um, the the, the different religions. So I looked at Judaism and Christianity and what it had to say about what motivates human creativity. And so the title... The soul of creativity, I think, really drew from my work 
of looking at the different religious traditions and what motivates human creativity. Going back to the creation narratives in G Genesis, the, the first book in, of, of the Old Testament. Um, and if you look at if you look at that, you can see a very clear path for human creativity. And there's a lot of interpretive context of that. Um, it certainly in the Jewish tradition and Christianity is very similar to to Judaism in terms of how it looks at this. So that's how the title. I think it was tapping so into what this. is what? Why do we create? Why? What is it about us as humans that that want it, that we we do quilt or paint or write music? Sure. I think that's what I think that is one of the mysteries of God's creation, in my view. I think why people create is one of those mysteries. Um, you know, some people would say, you know, those who are, you know, more religiously as opposed to spiritually oriented, some people would say, you know, we create to be partners with God in the creation. That's the classic Jewish. Um, one of the classic Jewish um, theories about creativity, we're commanded to be partners with God in creation and how we do it as our human creation. I think other people who have a more spiritual sense, but but maybe not as directed toward a particular religious tradition mm -hmm. might say, well, we create because that's how we express um, the hope and and darkness um, in a in an external you know form. I mean, if you think about it, if you think about the Holocaust, and I know that you know a lot about that yeah. topic. I know that that was one of your areas yeah. of expertise. But you think about all the artwork, not just the visual art, Elizabeth, but the music it, yeah. um, and the literature that came out of the Holocaust. I mean, and it, it, people knew that they weren't getting money for this. They didn't create to get money. That's always been my problem with the United States because the, the notion right. for why people create is so much more spiritually focused That's right. than money. I totally agree. I mean, it's yeah. interesting because, you know, we get this, this two, this dual tradition of like copyright coming out of England versus copyright coming out of France and sort of the importance right. of the artists coming out of France, which you know much better than I do. Um, but as I think about, you know, this project's been two years of me quilting every night and as I quilt, mm. sort of thinking about copyright and thinking about why we create and thinking about all these things. And I just think that even the people who are, I mean, they're making their living from it. I don't think the art, the space that they're in, I'm just really curious about like, as you're creating, like, is it always about, that's one of the things we're trying to get to is this notion of, are you putting like, I'm making this frog, is this going to make a lot of money? Or you are in a sort of more spiritual or, or yeah. artistic space of like, I'm making this frog. I know people like my things. I think this may make money, but that it is, I think most of the time what you're saying is that we're, we're creating because we want to create. Yes. That, it, that, that it is a separate thing, which yes. is ironic that 106A is like, the evil stepchild or the stepchild or the neglected child of copyright yeah. when it's the essence of copyright, which is so interesting to me. The sort of, I've created it. This is mine, right of integrity, right of, you know, I care what happens to it. I care that my name is on it. And then it's only a small subset of artistic works where copyright protects everything. It's so interesting and weird. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, and I think the stepchild um, analogy is a good one. It's very creative, Elizabeth. <laughs> I like that. Um, and, and I think that's true. I mean, it's always sort of been about money. And I'm not saying that there aren't artists for whom money is, is paramount. I, it's not a black or white situation. But by not recognizing um, a more substantial um, level of moral rights in the United States, what we really do is completely um, despiritualize the yeah. creative process well, I think and that's the that, problem yeah i think what's interesting about it is it really does tell you that copyright's an economic system it's always mm -hmm. been an economic system in the u.s it's not yes. about and that that it really did only protect things that were being mass mass reproduced books other things as new technology came into play we had to sort of identify it but it wasn't really meant for the artist it was meant for the producer of the materials and that becomes really clear when you think about like well what about you know, what about my art that I care about so much, right? Right. It's not about that. It's about, and so one little more, one more part to the story I'm really curious about because we've been talking to people in different contexts. How does user-generated content, the ability of all of us to make yeah. things, yeah. alter this? How does it yeah. shift it and does it put pressure on Vera or other parts of the Copyright Act? So... You know, that's a great question. And I deal with that in the soul of creativity. I talk about that. And I and I talk about the fact that it's um I talk about the fact that it's um it, it, it's it's a problem because 
it, it's so much easier in the digital age to manipulate content for better or worse. And so um, the joint authorship um, component, you know, becomes problematic. The integrity component becomes problematic. And I think it's just one of those areas that the law just has to sort of work its way out. As of right now, again, it's limited because Vera doesn't really cover user-generated content. It covers artwork, right? And it's it's all about the single, it's very traditional, it's high, high fine art is really what it's sort of focused on. Uh, exactly. Not posting something on the internet, um, exactly. Is, unless it's an infringement. I mean, unless you're infringing. I mean, if you you know you make some artwork and then it gets on the internet and there's some issues and blah blah blah. So I, I think that's super interesting. Okay, one more, and then the last piece of this is um, fan fiction and fan art. So when yeah. I dress up as something, there's a sense of that soul of creativity thing happening again. Like the reason I want to be that character is because I love it and I feel connected to it and I make my own costume and it's got all that stuff, but not protected at all by copyright or even bare or any, and you're using somebody else's material, right? Some other character that's protected by copyright, although we have spaces for this. So I think that's fairly interesting too, this kind of personhood theory or like I, it matters to me so much that I make it? Um, I'm, sure. How does that fit into this conversation? Um, so moral rights are very steeped in personhood. I mean, yeah. that's 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 really, you know, the one of the philosophical foundations for moral rights is, is a recognition of human dignity. I mean, it's really about human dignity, which right. is which is personhood. Right. And so you really can't, the reason we protect moral rights and the reason we should protect moral rights is to recognize the human dignity of individuals. Yeah. And so what you're talking about, that choice to to participate in in the fan fiction is really about protecting, you know, human dignity. Now, the question is, your choices are protected. The question is, you know, whether the actual result is protected, and if so, through what mechanism, you know, that gets a little bit more difficult, it's, right? Yeah, it gets very um, complicated, right? Yeah, so exactly. Interesting. Well, I think this is um, really awesome. I'm so excited that you came on and that you had you made some time for us because I know you're super busy, and um, I think this is a super important conversation to start having. Is sort of where Vera fits with, um, because I don't. I think if a Vera if quilting doesn't count under Vera, that's saying something about the status of quilting in the art world. And so I think it's an important conversation to be having because I think it's not useful articles, it is art. And I think we're finally, you know, at a point where it's like enough of that. Like enough wondering whether quilting is art. Um, and it is. So it is, absolutely. You know, and absolutely. I guess my question is like other forms of art may not be, if other forms of art are not protected under Vera, that Vera, that's okay. But, you know, if it's sort of like, um, I imagine performance art isn't protected or some right. sort of well, weird... Well, it's not fixed. So right, it doesn't have fixed. copyright protection. Right. So, you know, I, I guess that would be the question. But we don't have the fixation problem, definitely, because that's all we're doing is fixing pieces of fabric very aggressively to other Correct. pieces of fabric. And I don't think you have the originality problem no, in most instances. So I mean, so that was the problem with the landscape art case. It was lacking yeah. originality because of the lack of human authorship. Yeah. And you certainly don't have those problems. No, and we don't I have... think a very yeah. strong case can be made. Yeah, I think so too. Awesome. Well, I adore you. Thank you so much. Are you, do you need to review this before we post it? Or are you no, I think I'm good. I think yeah. I'm good. I trust you. <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, thank you again. You are so my very favorite forever and ever and ever. So I'm so psyched to chat with you. Um, I'm going to turn too. off the recording, um, but don't hang up. No. Okay, cool. The recording has stopped. So you've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. And I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gard. If you like this podcast, keep listening. Also, we have a Facebook group. Come join us. We talk about a lot of things. We also have an Instagram account. And of course, most importantly, I really hope you get a chance to quilt today. Quilt today.